Hello, John Linneman here. <laughs> Mr. Linneman, so nice to speak with you again. I believe you know who I am. Don't hang up. We're not playing Alfred Chicken again today. I got your boss right here, and he ain't coming back until you agree to do a DF Retro with me. What? What happened to Richard? What do you want, monster? Oh, not so fast, pretty boy. Turn on that PVM of yours. Richard, you son of a... What have you done to him? Oh, nothing yet. But I do have my CDI hooked up. Listen to reason, man. All you gotta do is make a Final Fight retrospective. Every single game, every single version. Let's do it together, even. After all, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Richard, John's boss at Digital Foundry, He's been kidnapped, and John needs our help! We gotta capture all the footage that we can. Count me in. Flashback to the 1980s, the emerging arcade experiences had been set ablaze with revolutionary graphics and technology being released seemingly on a monthly basis. From simplistic puzzle mazes and single-screen action games of the third kind released just a few years prior, companies such as Namco, Sega, Taito, Konami, and Capcom were now in competition to capture the imagination and attention of gamers around the world as they visited their local arcades to seek out the latest challenge. Capcom, having made its name with action games such as 1942, Gunsmoke, and Commando had also released a somewhat subpar but nonetheless interesting full-body experience fighting game cabinet known as Street Fighter, as well as the eccentric co-op shooter Forgotten Worlds. While neither are masterpieces in the gameplay department, Street Fighter and Forgotten Worlds showcase a thoughtful and concentrated effort when dealing with art design, graphics, and pixel artistry, dedicating huge amounts of memory to the visuals alone. The result is colorful games packed with large sprites and tons of personality, games where no two characters look alike. Seeing potential in this artistic direction, Capcom commissioned an internal team to combine their forces and create a sequel to Street Fighter. The earliest ideas for this new game would have Yu and Ken, the rarely seen two-player only character from the original Street Fighter, take on opponents together in a brawler rather than a one-on-one -on -one fighter. The idea was scrapped, however, due to a sense that the game's marketability in the US needed a rougher, tougher cast. The game's design team, Akira Nishitani and Akira Yasuda, better known as Akiman today, were sent to do market research in America on both the East and West Coast. What they discovered was that American players approached games in a fundamentally different way compared to what they were accustomed to in Japan. In Japan, fast-paced, score-driven games were all the rage, but in America, players were willing to spend more credits for additional lives, opting for games such as Double Dragon 2 where their chances of reaching the end were higher. This would play an important part in the approach to what was now known internally at Capcom as Street Fighter 89. Upon returning to Japan, Akiman's setting and character design began to take shape based largely upon his findings in the US. The introduction of VHS in Japan, however, had allowed for Japanese teenagers and young adults alike to discover the wealth of entertainment found in the American and European B-movie genre, with the post-apocalyptic or rundown streets of New York City being the perfect backdrop for this urban battler. Movies such as Death Wish 3, The Warriors, and Jackie Chan's Spartan X, also known as Wheels on Meals, would play constantly at the development offices of Capcom. It was a pair of Walter Hill directed films that would perhaps be the most influential to this production. 1975's Hard Times and 1984's Streets of Fire captured that feeling that Aquaman had set out to create, with Hard Times' depressive brutalism showcasing street fights and back alleys with a no nonsense fighter played by Charles Bronson, whereas the rock action opera Streets of Fire sees Michael Pare, stars Tom Cody, a man taking on a gang of thugs, and Menaces who had kidnapped the young Ellen. 
The blend of 1950s noir and 1970s New York City combined with the bombastic action was a perfect fit for the team at Capcom, and many elements from the characters to the story setting can be traced back to Streets of Fire. Interestingly enough, Hard Times was released in Japan as Street Fighter in the 1980s. December of 1989, the hotly anticipated Street Fighter 89, now known as Final Fight, finally made its way to arcades worldwide. In Final Fight, Mayor Mike Hagar, a former professional wrestler turned local politician, sees his daughter Jessica kidnapped by the Mad Gear Gang, a group of thugs that Hagar had promised on the campaign trail to end once and for all. Seeing himself without any alternative, however, Hagar takes off his shirt puts on a suspenders, and takes to the streets to dish out justice, and of course rescue his daughter. Jessica's sweetheart since high school, Cody Travers, and his best friend and ninja-in-training guy join the fight upon hearing the news of Jessica's disappearance. Over the course of the game, players will be fighting their way through the streets of Metro City, all the way to the top of the highest building in town, where the corrupt Belga runs the Mad Gear, looking down upon the city. The designs in the game are all taken from pop culture and real-life counterparts. The game's main protagonist, Mike Hagar, is an amalgamation of several sources, from the middle-aged vigilante you find in Charles Bronson in the Death Wish series, to the increasingly popular pro wrestler such as Macho Man Rick Rude in the American scene. Perhaps this stranger inspiration, though still suitably hockey man, is that of Mayor Jean Valjean of Les Miserables. Cody, on the other hand, is more like a mix of American teenage heartthrobs like James Dean and of course Michael Pare's interpretation of Tom Cody in the Streets of Fire film, while Guy is more of a traditional Capcom video game character as the higher-ups of Capcom required ninjas to be present in nearly all of their games. He shares some similarities to the Street Fighter characters of Ryu and Ken, being an American-born Japanese martial artist who seeks out fights and challenges around the world to improve his skills. The Mad Gear Gang then takes their name from an earlier Capcom game, Mad Gear, also known as Lead Storm in the US, and features characters and names taken straight from the world of rock and heavy metal as well as other pop culture icons. The Andore family takes an obvious direct inspiration from pro wrestlers such as Andre the Giant, while Gene, Slash, Axel are all based on famous rock artists at the time like Axel Rose and Gene Simmons. The character of Poison is perhaps the most interesting in the entire game, and while her origins and initial portrayal has been a hot topic of debate since release, there's no denying that her beautiful design, no-nonsense attitude, and strong independent presence have made her a fan favorite throughout of Capcom's illustrious roster, while her continued presence in games make her more and more interesting. Her design was primarily based on Hollywood from the glorious women of wrestling, better known today as GLOW. Now, as a game, Final Fight is a direct response to earlier brawlers, in particular, Double Dragon 2, following its urban setting and narrative themes. What sets the game apart, though, is the size and presentation of its sprites, as well as addictive and responsive gameplay. Like Double Dragon, two players can play simultaneously, though the cast plays vastly differently from one to another. Hagar is slow and strong, for instance. Guy is fast, yet less powerful, while Cody sits somewhere in the middle. Weapons such as pipes, swords, and knives can be used in close quarters, and characters can throw their opponents across the screen, with Hagar even having the ability to launch himself in the air for the devastating flying pile driver. Now, other games such as Ninja Gaiden in the arcades, which was more of a brawler as well, also served some inspiration as the continue screen is a direct nod to the Tecmo game. Final Fight is powered by Capcom's CP System arcade board, capable of throwing around huge numbers of colorful sprites against detailed parallax backgrounds. The game runs at a resolution of 384 by 224 making it sharper than anything you could play on a home console at the time. The original CPS hardware formed the basis of Capcom's arcade output for years before being replaced with the CP System 2. Compared to the choppy Double Dragon series, Final Fight offers a smooth 60 frames per second action with minimal slowdown that feels just that much better to play. 
But there's a lot more to these giant sprites than their design. They also behave differently, which is a key part of what makes Final Fight a special game. Different enemies can shuffle around you, attack aggressively or defensively, and basically come at the player from any direction. The inclusion of a highly controllable and satisfying jump mechanic also sets the game apart from its contemporaries, as well as the oh-so-satisfying but self-inflicting extra joy move, allowing for some nice crowd control. To break up the monotony though, the bonus round was introduced, allowing players to smash up a perfectly fine looking Honda Legend for extra points, much to the chagrin of the Mad Gear thug who owns it. The music is also outstanding, with nearly every level featuring amazing music from the composer team of seven artists, including legends such as Yoko Shimomura, Manami Matsumae, and Yoshihiro Sakaguchi, to name a few. Final Fight is simply a brawler that feels heavy, grounded, and precise, and makes every punch, kick, and tumble come through the screen. If you recall in my recent Streets of Rage 4 video, I mentioned the three pillars concept as it relates to brawlers. The idea is that the best brawlers need a satisfying basic attack, a powerful, catchy soundtrack, and strong visual design. Of course, Final Fight meets all three criteria and then some, delivering one of the most stunning games in the genre at the time of release. Capcom had redefined the beat-em-up genre with Final Fight and the success of the game would lead directly into the actual sequel to their middling effort in Street Fighter 1, soon to redefine yet another genre. Now before leaving the arcades completely, we should take a quick look at one more curiosity. Released only in certain areas of Asia and South America, the PCB board hack called Street Smart can be found on unofficial multi-game units and modifies Final Fight with various new features. Now you can play with several of the enemy characters, the overall color palette has been changed, the game is sped up, and the stages are all out of order. It's a neat idea, but with the limited amounts of frames per enemy character, as well as some rather intrusive bugs, it's clear that this hack is somewhat slapped together and on the cheap side. The success of Final Fight in the arcades then was massive, a true masterclass in game design and art direction. It became the first in a new line of games for Capcom, taking heavy inspiration from Akiman's art designs and setting their games in the same universe, with potential crossovers in mind for the future. Of course, with such success, the company was eager to bring the action home to the masses, and today there are numerous ways to enjoy Final Fight. In 1991, however, we would see the announcement of the very first port on the brand new 16-bit consoles. And shortly after its reveal, Final Fight for the Super Famicom slash Super NES was announced and released one year after the arcade in Japan. Final Fight on the Super Nintendo then is both impressive yet disappointing. Even at the time of its release, fans were quick to point out the numerous omissions and issues that plagued the game. Developed under severe time and budget constraints, the SNES game makes use of an 8 megabit ROM, far from enough memory to fit the 32 megabit arcade game. Due to unfamiliarity with the hardware, the lack of time and size constraints, Capcom had to significantly cut portions of the game in order to run at the lowest expectations while transporting the code over from the arcade with minimal optimization. So before anything else then, it's the omission of the game's two-player mode that proves to be a fatal setback for the game, but there's a lot of other issues as well. For starters, Guy has been cut completely from the game with zero traces remaining. The amount of enemies is also greatly reduced, the smaller details such as stage introductions are entirely gone and Nintendo's strict censorship policies at the time meant that several aspects had to be changed, most noticeably the change to Poison and Roxy to the characters of Sid and Billy. And the arguably better, Oh My Car! Oh my car! Rather than, Oh my god! An entire stage, the industrial area, is also completely omitted. The game was so rushed that it still has a lot of debug menus and numerous cut tiles and objects still on the cart even. 
Rumor has it that due to Capcom's developers either being so skilled at the game due to running through it time and time again, or perhaps just due to an oversight, the game code actually runs at the game's highest difficulty dip switch setting on default, making it not only one player, but incredibly difficult as well. There are some positives though. The graphics and colors are certainly lush for such an early game on the system, and the music is nicely rearranged with the use of appropriate samples and not too much reverb that would become a real issue with Super NES games going forward. Capcom would later release an update to the game titled Final Fight Guy, which replaces Cody with the previously cut Guy, along with numerous smaller changes as well. As expected, nearly all mentions of Cody are now gone, and the game features new items such as chicken roasts and oranges, while a brand new 1-up item can be randomly acquired from barrels. Additionally, the numerous backgrounds have been touched up and given extra animation, and the game features several endings based on which difficulty you clear, which would carry over to subsequent sequels as well. Final Fight Guy would release in Japan in March of 1992, but it would not make its way to North America until June of 94, and then only as a blockbuster exclusive rental, kind of like Clay Fighter the Sculptor's Cut for N64 that would appear years later. Now, in Japan, the game came packaged with an arrangement CD as well, which is a really nice bonus, I think. Over the years, however, the community has attempted to address many of the game's flaws, including patching in the ability to use two players, and even adding in the CD soundtrack thanks to MSU1 support. It's not perfect, but it's a nice upgrade to a flawed release and definitely worth checking out. While the Super NES port was a big deal, there were other iterations of Final Fight released. The X68000 computer system saw a home release in Japan in the summer of 1992. Being the original development hardware for Capcom at the time, this port comes as close to the arcade as you could imagine, though without the dedicated RAM of an arcade board, the X68 port features less sprites on screen at the same time. The music is also slightly rearranged with the choice of either the internal sound hardware, which I think sounds great, or an external MIDI module such as those from Roland. This version also comes packaged with the Final Fight Special CD containing new arrangements from Alf Lila, Capcom's in-house band. The microcomputers also got their respective ports of Final Fight to varying degrees of success. Looking at older hardware, such as the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64, it is obvious that the game simply couldn't be recreated on the hardware without either severe cutbacks or a complete retooling. And it's exactly what you'd expect. They're interesting conversions given the nature of the hardware, but ultimately, in my opinion, not really worth playing today. The Amiga version, though, is visually quite impressive, at least in the surface. It makes use of programmer Richard Aplin's self-made sprite ripping and tile ripping technique from the arcade game. The resulting data allows the original artwork to be reproduced on the Amiga, albeit with a lower color palette due to the Amiga performing better with less colors on screen. It looks really impressive in screenshots, but it kind of falls apart once you actually sit down to play it. You see, it lacks the majority of the moves, runs at a low frame rate with tons of slowdown, lacks music entirely, and exhibits dreadful AI. The game was published by US Gold, which only gave programmer Richard Applin around six months to complete it. 
Beyond that, this version also appeared on Atari ST, but with even more restrictions, making it an inferior conversion, as you would expect. Each of these microcomputer iterations are interesting in their own right, but all of them fall short. Perhaps the most fondly remembered conversion of Final Fight, however, arrived exclusively on Sega's Mega CD platform in 1993. Reprogrammed by Sega themselves exclusively for the new CD add-on, Final Fight CD is a direct answer to the unfortunate Super NES version and comes front-loaded with nearly all of the features from the arcade original, while also including some incredible exclusive content. For starters, the game now features all three characters selectable right from the beginning, and most importantly, two-player simultaneous play. All stage introductions have been reintroduced as well as transitions, and the enemy AI remains close to the arcade original as well. Poison is reintroduced, though her sprite features some alterations from the arcade game to comply with the ratings board of the time. A brand new time attack mode is also introduced with an exclusive bridge top background, and new cinematic sequences with full voice acting have been added for that authentic CD experience. Perhaps more importantly, the music is now entirely Redbook audio thanks to the CD capabilities of the Mega CD system, and fully rearranged by the production house Tease Music, featuring 90s-tastic interpretations of the original tracks. This version is not without flaws, however, as the conversion technique used by Sega resulted in some of the palettes being slightly off. As expected, the game also features a lower amount of enemies on screen at the same time, and the three characters are all slowed down, playing more like one another in terms of hit speed than in other versions of the game. Now, a user by the name of Pyron released a color correction hack a few years ago, so with the help of the fan community, the game can now look much closer to the arcade original, and as you can see here, it brings back some of the detail that had been lost in the conversion process. Really cool stuff. Final Fight on the Mega CD then is an absolute essential for the system, and perhaps the best port of the game, at least of the era, in terms of offering the arcade experience alongside some welcome enhancements. It's my personal favorite version of the original Final Fight. Post Mega CD, the original version of Final Fight would mostly receive re-releases across compilations and collections, which strive more for arcade accuracy rather than new features. However, there is one version released in 2001 that does attempt to bring something new to the fight. I'm talking about Final Fight 1, O-N-E, released for the Game Boy Advance. It's what could best be described as an enhanced version of the Super NES version of Final Fight rather than a port of the arcade game. Now, for one, it retains a lot of the changes made specifically in that original version, including the missing objects in the background of Stage 3. What is new, however, is the ability to play with two players via Game Link, the missing stage is reinserted, and you can unlock and play as Cody and Guy in their Street Fighter Zero designs. New boss fight dialogue with artwork by Bengus has also been added as well. It is a nice upgrade to the SNES version, and it does look pretty close to that version though with slightly washed out colors and, again, less characters on screen. Now, years later, across the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and the PSP, the game saw release in the Capcom Classics Collection by Digital Eclipse. These were arcade emulations rather than ports, however, and as such provide a good overall experience, with some of the original designs and concept art as unlockables. The console releases exhibit the blurry filtering that would plague many of Digital Eclipse's releases of that time, however, and the sound emulation really isn't up to snuff. But the PSP version does actually look the best to my eyes thanks to the pixel-perfect mode available in the options, even if the aspect ratio is slightly incorrect as a result. Unfortunately, things are less impressive on PlayStation 2 and Xbox. For starters, the PS2 version only seems to support 480i output, while Xbox is locked to 480p. Neither version supports proper 240p output, which would have been perfect for this game, and as a result, it's either flickery and blurry, or just kind of blurry on the Xbox. But it's not the only release on PS2 and Xbox. There's also this nightmare. The unlockable arcade version of Final Fight contained within 
Final Fight Streetwise, a game we'll discuss in more detail later in this video. Using a poorly configured installation of MAME, this unlockable bonus is so bad I nearly burst out laughing upon seeing it for the first time, and the severity of the issues even vary per console. On PlayStation 2, the visuals are little more than a bad joke, with a combination of bilinear filtering and oddly sharp pixel edges leading to this ugly, smeary, hideous presentation. I don't even know how else to describe it. There's just... it's... it's atrocious. But what's worse, it runs at just 20 frames per second, and exhibits sound emulation issues on top of that. It looks and plays just terribly. Then there's the Xbox version, which looks slightly less horrific visually, but still manages to run at a low 20 frames per second frame rate only this time, with screen tearing on top of that. Plus, glitches can appear right in the middle of the stage and remain on screen throughout. Basically, what I'm saying here is that this release of Final Fight may go down in history as one of the worst examples of emulation on a home console. Just an absolute joke. Now, on the Xbox 360 and PS3, Final Fight saw yet another release in 2010 via a double pack with Magic Sword titled Final Fight Double Impact. This emulated version adds new graphical filters, a proper bezel around the screen, a new arranged and oddly electronic soundtrack from Simon Vicklund of Bionic Commando Rearmed fame. As well as additional unlockable content, ranging from artwork to comic books and music. Rather than being handled by Digital Eclipse though, this version was done by Proper Games, a fitting name in this case. It is, by and large, a very accurate port with some intriguing extras and well worth the price of $9.99. Though the game does have some rather obtuse DRM which restricts the game to one account per console on PlayStation 3. In addition though, the game did get a physical release via the Capcom Digital Collection for Xbox 360. This version also served as the basis for the iOS release the following year. Now, with so many versions of the original game, it might be hard to pick one depending on what you seek. For fans of the pure arcade experience, Final Fight Double Impact does a good job in presenting the game in its original form, and does some interesting things with extra material, along with being packed with Magic Sword. For home console fans who want the best home experience, however, the Sega CD version is really hard to beat, with its perfect soundtrack, excellent gameplay, and even brand new modes of play. For those open to unofficial approaches, however, MAME does allow you to add the Sega CD soundtrack to the arcade original if you want the best of both worlds, and fans have even hacked the ability to play three players simultaneously in this version, which is just kind of insane. There's even three additional newer versions of the game, which we'll talk about later in the video. When it comes to Final Fight though, there are many ways to play the game and many of them offer exciting exclusives and potential modifications from the fan community. So things are certainly not final when it comes to Final Fight. Shortly after completing Final Fight 1 on Super NES, Capcom began production on two new Nintendo-based Final Fight games. After all, Nintendo had acquired the rights to any sequels. The first is, well, Final Fight 2, the direct sequel to the original game, developed exclusively for Super Famicom. Having its framework entirely rebuilt from the ground up, Final Fight 2 sets out to correct all the wrongs made with the original conversion on the system and elaborate on the mechanics even further. Now taking place across the world, Mike Hagar gets an abrupt phone call from Japan as Guy's sister-in-law, Maki, informs him that her father and sister have been kidnapped by the new and world-encompassing Mad Gear, and unfortunately, Guy is out of town and Cody is on vacation. So Hagar must once again leave office and seemingly leave all the decisions up to his secretary as he takes a prolonged leave to assist in the rescue of Guy's girlfriend and Maki's father. Though before leaving, Hagar is approached by one Carlos Miyamoto who has sworn to help and protect him throughout his journey. Now obviously the big new feature this time is the option to play in two-player mode, 
which corrects one of the first game's biggest flaws. Hagar features a completely reworked moveset, while the newcomers make changes to the core formula that are interesting in their own right. The mechanics have all been tightened up to allow for better chaining of strikes and throws, and the additional 1-up item seen in Final Fight Guy also makes an appearance. Stages can now scroll up and down as opposed to just left and right, something which had been made popular in other brawlers of the time. And of course, all stages have several segments like the original as well, though with more of a postcard flair as each location is now based around landmarks in their respective countries. Visually speaking, Final Fight 2 is an improvement on the original, but retains that letterboxed presentation and lower resolution compared to the arcade game. The updated character designs all look and animate nicely as well, and the game even connects the series closer to Street Fighter, as you can see with some familiar faces in the background. The world map also bears a strong resemblance to Street Fighter 2. So while fine on the surface with a proper 2 player mode and 3 playable characters as well as an expanded moveset, Final Fight 2 doesn't quite live up to the original game. For one, the redesign of the enemies really lacks that urban grittiness of the original, as do the locations which now feel more generic and rather shoehorned into the world trotting plot. The amount of enemies is also kind of disappointing as they repeat again and again, not even redressing them slightly for the regions they take place in. The AI is at least better than the first game, but still lacks the diversity found in the original arcade release, making each stage somewhat long and repetitive. And on top of that, the music, one of the most important pillars of any brawler, is completely forgettable and barely listenable, a complete step backwards from the catchy and memorable soundtrack in the first game. Perhaps the worst offense though are the boss fights and the designs however. In the original, bosses each had a natural progression and somewhat believable structure, but in the sequel, bosses come off as silly characters. In London for instance, you meet a street clown, and in the climactic fight in Japan, a neon cyberpunk kabuki, who was apparently controlling the mad gear across the world, is your opponent. It all comes off as kind of uninspired and nonsensical, an issue the first game definitely doesn't have. The plot is also paper thin, which might sound like a weird thing to talk about in a beat em up game like this, but the fact that Maki calls Hagar from Japan, then has them travel to Hong Kong, France, England, and Italy, only discovered that they had to go back to Japan where Maki was in the first place, it renders the entire trip pointless and surely fitting for an impeachment of Mayor Hagar's spending practices. It's all silliness. Final Fight 2 does bring a lot of good to the table, but with increased competition from Sega, with their Fantastic Streets of Rage series already eclipsing Capcom's efforts, as well as Jellico's rushing beat series steadily improving on the Super Famicom itself, it just doesn't do enough to keep the series fresh and fun, like the original game did. There is a hidden ending though when you play through the game on Expert, showing more of what is going on with Guy and his training, but it's not a big deal. All in all, Final Fight 2 is a letdown as a follow-up to one of the greatest brawlers of all time, but it's an okay game for those seeking co-op action on the Super NES. Unfortunately, the game has never seen a port, making it a true Super NES exclusive. The second follow-up from Capcom, though, is the charming retelling of the original game known as Mighty Final Fight for the NES. Mighty Final Fight sees the story retold and reimagined with super deformed character designs and more humor used throughout compared to the original. Being one of the later released titles for the NES, appearing in 1993, well after the release of Super NES, Mighty Final Fight makes extensive use of layered sprites on the MMC3 mapper and showcases some of the finest sprite detail and presentation on the system as a whole. Produced by industry legend Tokuro Fujiwara, Mighty Final Fight is even more of a direct nod to the Double Dragon series, bringing the original NES game's experience and level up systems back, while increasing Hagar, Guy, and Cody's movesets as they level up. The basic gameplay from the original is retained, though there's a greater emphasis on one-on-one -on -one combat, as only so many sprites can appear at one time. As is to be expected with a game that is already pushing the NES to its limits, it is limited to just one player, due to the number of sprites on screen at the time. 
Now, beyond this, the music is nearly completely overhauled as well, as are the stages, which now exhibit more variety, such as stage hazards and pits. The boss fights also take an interesting turn, having introduction texts and a choice of answer for comedic effect. Even Poison appears in this game, though this is the only official Nintendo version she appears in. This rare NES game is among the more impressive efforts in the system and ranks pretty well with Capcom's output on the NES, though it can't entirely escape its own repetitiveness by the end of the game. It does certainly make for a fun ride though, as you make your way through 8-bit Metro City. While Mighty File Fight has only been released on Nintendo hardware, there exists a very interesting unofficial port of the game. In 2018, Nick Sanchez, who had previously brought us the spectacular Castlevania Spectral Interlude, also on the Specky, brought Mighty Final Fight to the system. Now, despite the lack of color and the system's usual issues of color clashing, it's still a remarkably faithful port with some adjustments made to the gameplay. It's quite impressive considering the limitation of this British micro. While Capcom was already at work on the next Nintendo exclusive entry into the series, they had also gone back in time with another game to showcase Mike Hagar's illustrious past as a professional wrestler. In Muscle Bomber, The Body Explosion, or Saturday Night Slam Masters outside of Japan, Hagar and a roster of Street Fighter II worthy wrestlers take on the CWA circuit and figure out the mystery of their missing superstar friend Victor Ortega. The game is a hybrid between wrestling and traditional one-on-one -on -one fighting game mechanics, leading to one of Capcom's standout arcade games of the time with beautiful pixel art graphics and four-player simultaneous play. The game's packaging and marketing design was handled by the legendary Hokuto no Ken creator Tetsuo Hara and blends well with the original Akiman concepts as well as making use of discarded designs from the Street Fighter series, such as Missing IQ Gomez for Blanca, and of course Titanic Tim for T-Hawk. Canonically, the Muscle Bomber series takes place several years prior to the events of Final Fight, and Hagar's daughter Jessica even makes an appearance. Muscle Bomber would also get an arcade-exclusive sequel, Super Muscle Bomber, but if you're interested in these games, be sure to check out Audi's wrestling video game tome, Wrestling with Pixels, which goes into the development of the games themselves in great detail. With Final Fight still locked under Nintendo exclusivity, the last game in the trilogy would arrive on Super Famicom on December 22nd, 1995, more than a year after PlayStation launched as Final Fight Tough, while North America would get it in early 96 under the title Final Fight 3. Released well into the emerging life cycle of the 32-bit systems and at the tail end of the Super NES's reign, Final Fight 3 showcases some refreshing new takes on the beat em up genre, which had now faded in popularity inside and outside of Capcom as the fighting game genre was seen back-to-back -back innovation in both 2D and 3D by 96. Mad Gear has finally dissolved thanks to Hagar and his super friends, but now the Skullcross Gang has launched a terrorist attack on Metro City only seconds after the re-emerging guy is greeted in Mayor Hagar's offices. As they watch the flames from the office window over a cup of coffee, the recently recruited Lucia Morgan of the Special Crimes Unit comes to alert the mayor of the attack, while the mysterious Dean comes in uninvited to inform Hagar he knows where the leader of the Skullcross gang is. With Guy and Hagar ready to hit the streets once again, Final Fight 3 begins. With the graphic style of Final Fight 2 more resembling the arcade original, Final Fight 3 is interesting and it takes a brand new direction backed by the art design scene in the more recent Street Fighter Zero slash Alpha series, with flatter shading and clean black lines along with brighter colors, something resembling more recent Japanese animation as opposed to the grittier 80s action films and backstreets of the original games. This new art direction was headed by longtime Capcom illustrator Bengus and demonstrates some of the best graphics in a Capcom game in the system with a vibrant color palette and lush gradients throughout. Now the returning cast from Hagar and Cody to Mad Gear cast-offs such as Andore and Billy have seen their designs slightly changed as well, as Guy takes more of his taller slender shape from the Street Fighter Zero 2 design while Hagar now rocks a porntastic ponytail. Similar to Streets of Rage 3, Dean makes extensive use of electroshocking attacks while Guy now sports what is clearly a 
chi-based projectile system similar to the Street Fighter series. The game's mechanics now also implement more input-driven techniques, allowing for quarter-circle-based attacks much like fighting games, as well as a brand new super meter which can launch you into a special, devastating finishing move. Characters can also dash, evade, and perform run-based offense, so there's clearly a lot more ways of attacking your enemies this time around. Two-player mode is also on full display as it should be, though Final Fight 3 offers the ability of having the second player controlled by the CPU, which is certainly interesting though somewhat flawed in execution, as the CPU will illogically just move forward for most of the time rather than focusing on enemies. The AI in general doesn't quite live up to the standards set by Streets of Rage 2 and other games before it, so that ever-present issue with repetitive patterns certainly makes its way into Final Fight 3 as well. Level design also takes a step back from the World Tour scenario and is now comfortably back in the streets of Metro City, with the back alleys, parks, and docks backdropping the action once again, and the team making their way to the rooftops to defeat the evil leader of the gang. Being that the game is built yet again from the ground up on the Super NES, stage transitions are back, as are brand new cutscenes between the stages used to tie together the ever-expanding plot. New to this game are also the diverging paths, which offer some exploration of different areas each time you play. With the new additional elements borrowed from Capcom's amazing lineup of fighting games, as well as the action taking place on familiar grounds, Final Fight 3 sounds like it should be the best experience on the Super NES to date, but unfortunately, that's not really the case. The game demonstrates some of the worst slowdown I've ever seen on the console, with the action almost never taking place at a full 60 frames per second. It doesn't help that the game is more or less a complete retread of the first game, which, when it doesn't play quite as well, doesn't really add enough of a new experience overall. The issue is that it's just not as memorable as the original game, with its simple yet refined gameplay and charm. The music, though, fares much better this time, and unlike Final Fight 2, sees some standout pieces that have actually been featured in other Capcom games to come. It's a welcome change from the dreadful effort in Final Fight 2. The composer Katsunari Kitajima was a popular choice for Capcom at the time, and his compositions certainly fit well alongside their arcade offerings at this time. Final Fight 3 then is an interesting game. It's the last in the classic series and introduces many new mechanics as well as an expanded plot with both familiar and new characters. However, by this time, with the fierce competition of 2D fighters from Capcom themselves as well as companies such as SNK, the traditional brawler had seen itself rendered somewhat obsolete and repetitive, and was in need of more than simply a few transported mechanics from 2D fighters to stay relevant. It's a fine game, probably the best Final Fight sequel to date, and a good experience, but that experience is plagued with slowdown. Maybe this would be a game that could benefit from the SA1 modifications that have been developed by the fan community. There is one more game to take a quick look at. After all, it would not be a DF Retro slash Audi collaboration without touching on the fact that there exists an unofficial Famicom Pirate port. Final Fight by the ever-dependable Hummer team, which we took a look at in the Mortal Kombat retrospective, did a conversion of the SNES original to the NES, and it's quite impressive in its own right. Featuring all four characters, the game naturally has fewer enemy characters, no real boss characters at the end of the stages, and fewer sprites on screen at the same time. The branching paths are also gone. The music is really good, since it's lifted straight from Mighty Final Fight. Hagar is now known as Hugger, for some reason, but at least the game is named Final Fight 3, whereas most other pirate companies would probably name it Final Fight 9. But what it is here is quite impressive for an unofficial effort, and compared to Mighty Final Fight, it brings an experience closer to the first original arcade game more so than Capcom's own super deformed effort. In 2016, user Furious Hedgehog created a patch for this pirate titled Final Fight 3 Deluxe, which fixes all the grammatical errors and naming conventions, restores some of the graphics that were changed, and makes the game even closer to the SNES original. It is actually most impressive. With Capcom's interest lying squarely in the 2D fighting game genre and relegating most of their brawler games to more experimental efforts, the cast of Final Fight, proving themselves beloved and memorable, saw themselves recast and refitted into the Street Fighter series. 
In Street Fighter Zero, Guy makes his first appearance, featuring a moveset that makes use of familiar keyframes from the Final Fight series, as well as his stage making use of an arrangement of the first stage theme from Final Fight 1. Sodom, the katana-wielding boss in the original, is also playable in the game. In Street Fighter Zero 2, then, Rolento joins the fight, while in Street Fighter Zero 3, Cody returns, now sporting his prison uniform as he has faced imprisonment for his continued street fighting and reckless behavior. Taking place in the same universe, these games effectively fill out and continue the Final Fight saga, as the events in these games coincide with the official Final Fight entries. But Final Fight would soon find itself in the fighting game arena, albeit in a much stranger fashion than one might expect from a fighting game juggernaut such as Capcom, developed by the American-based Capcom USA team, which would later become known as Capcom Production Studio 8, Final Fight Revenge is a 3D fighting game fought on a 2D plane and only released in the arcade on the Sega Saturn-based STV system, while later being released on the Saturn itself in Japan using the 4MB RAM card. Despite being an American-produced Japan-only game, the game does try to further the story. Somewhat. Mad Gear has reformed, and riots have broken out yet again in Metro City, while Hagar's daughter Jessica has been reported missing once again. Final Fight Revenge stars a selection of the cast found throughout the series, with Hagar, Cody, Guy, Poison, Andore, Damned, and a few other Final Fight regulars making an appearance. While the game's mechanics are mostly based around 2D movement, the 3D space can be utilized for defensive purposes and placement. The game uses a 5-button system rather than using the traditional 3 or 6 found in other Capcom fighting games, with two strengths of punch and kick as well as a special button. The special button introduces most of the unique features in the game as it allows players to either pick up weapons along the arena floor or execute the special finishing techniques. Rather than supernatural projectiles and the like, then Final Fight Revenge makes extensive use of weapon-based projectiles either worn by the fighters from the start of the match or picked up on the ground during the fight, depending on your selection. The game's graphics also take an interesting approach. Final Fight Revenge's graphic style makes use of highly animated and cartoon-looking 3D polygon models that don't rely as heavily on textures, while employing an infinite plane floor system with 2D backgrounds similar to Tekken or Dead or Alive. The game's art style, headed by former Disney artist Raymond Fung, certainly takes the series in a different direction than expected as well. The models are quite stocky, and the limbs will grow in size on the fly to emphasize power and impact, while the character appearance and likenesses are highly stylized. It's not bad, and while Capcom's 2D efforts evoke more of a Japanese animation feel, Final Fight Revenge finds itself more akin to something based on a Saturday morning TV show on American television. The game's music, handled by Jim Wallace, is also quite unique. Rather than bombastic themes and recognizable motifs based around the characters and locations in the series, Final Fight Revenge's soundtrack is more similar to a television drama with orchestral hits, jazzy backdrops, and a somewhat subdued soundscape from what was expected in a fighting game in 1999. <laughs> It's not bad music per se, but due to the action on screen, it fails to properly establish itself in the game, and you're left with very few memorable tracks in a series that has enjoyed quite a few all-time fan favorites that it could have drawn upon. The sound in general is also fairly standard, with some questionable line reading and repetitive cries, but nothing out of the norm for the genre. Final Fight Revenge has a reputation for being a bad fighting game, and while it certainly has its flaws, it's not entirely deserved to relegate it to the discard pile. The action is slow, yes, and the presentation a little dull, despite some interesting use of humor and scale, but it's a 3D fighter with some fairly basic and sound fundamentals, and it also runs really well, targeting 60 frames per second with minimal slowdown. What makes Final Fight Revenge most interesting, however, is its status as a collectible, released only in Japan on the Sega Saturn in 2000, after the release of Sega Dreamcast, Final Fight Revenge is the very last Capcom Sega Saturn game, and it was printed in a very limited quantity, making it one of the most sought-after releases in the Sega Saturn library. It's also remarkably close to the arcade original, which comes as no surprise with the STV hardware being virtually identical to the Sega Saturn itself. 
Following the release of Final Fight Revenge, though, the series would go dormant for years to come, barring some re-releases. The cast of Final Fight could be found in other active games, such as the aforementioned Street Fighter Zero series, as well as in the official Street Fighter mainline series as Poison and Hugo, a member of the gigantic Andori family, made their way into the roster of Street Fighter III's second impact. In the monumental crossover Capcom vs SNK2, Final Fight 2's Maki made her fighting game debut, while Hager planned to be featured in the cancelled but location-tested Capcom Fighting All-Stars, a game that eventually was retooled and released into the 2D fighting game Capcom Fighting Jam without Hagar. Hagar and Guy would eventually make their way into Namco Cross Capcom as playable characters in the excellent All-Star lineup combining the universes of video game companies. At this point, it seems as though the series has been relegated to characters appearing in other games, but there was one more game to be released under the Final Fight name. Final Fight Streetwise. Final Fight Streetwise is the last official attempt at bringing the series back. It's also the one that I've played the least. To discuss it, I wanted to bring in our second guest of the episode, brawler aficionado and Final Fight Streetwise apologist, Matt McMuscles. Ah, uh, geez, I've played so much Final Fight Streetwise, and I don't really have an explanation as to why. Released in the early parts of 2006 for the PS2 and Xbox, Final Fight Streetwise was the result of several years of attempts from Studio 8 to bring Final Fight up to modern times and bring the fight back to the streets, quite literally. The first attempt was called Final Fight Seven Sons, a straightforward 3D beat-em-up that utilized a camera system which was on rails, much like Gekido Urban Fighters on the PS1. It featured a brand new nameless character, the ability to power up into a Hulk-like form and utilize cell shading as part of its art style. Reportedly, Capcom execs rejected this pitch and instead wanted Studio 8 to refocus the project to mimic Grand Theft Auto. This resulted in an open-world action adventure set several years after the ending of Final Fight 3. Streetwise brings in newcomer Kyle, the younger brother of Cody, and tells his story living in the shadows of his big bro and coming up in the ranks as an underground fighter. Metro City, seemingly never able to deal with all of its crime issues, despite the many attempts from now former Mayor Hagar, is now facing an even greater danger. The new drug Glow, which has quickly been making its way into the darker pits of the city, somewhat similar to the plot of Robocop 2 and Nuke. As Kyle makes his way through the city, he runs into many of the men and women that assisted in Hagar's fight against organized crime, and is taken under their wings to reach his own potential and maybe crush this new evil once and for all. Now, it's pretty well known that the reception to this game was massively negative, but 14 years on, it's time to revisit and see how it all stacks up. Metro City is now open and explorable, with homeless drunks, thugs, pimps, prostitutes, and businessmen playing kids' magic tricks on every street corner. Similar to games such as Shenmue, the various characters can give you objectives and tasks to finish, such as getting back stolen purses, or give hints, or talk about events taking place around the city. The game features 10 minigames, from shooting ranges to cockroach exterminator and arm wrestling, with all their own distinct set of rules and mechanics. Metro City is segmented off into four areas, Japantown, Little Italy, the Pier District, and Kyle's Hood, offering a semi-open world experience which opens up as you play through the game. The melee combat, essential to any brawler, has seen some modernization by allowing Kyle to upgrade his moveset by purchasing moves at a gym, while also introducing the new instinct mode, effectively allowing you to counter moves or execute a well-placed, extra-powerful set of combos and techniques. Naturally, weapons can be picked up, ripped off walls, found behind the bar counter. It's a much more dynamic sense of action and mayhem than seen in the previous games. The melee combat as a whole is actually fairly well executed, and it doesn't feel all that bad. At times, the game actually does show some potential, especially in the early stages of the game, like the bar brawl which nails the atmosphere and allows for some fun destruction and chaos to your surroundings. 
but it is everything around this combat system that ultimately brings the game down. First, let's look at the graphics. While at glance, nothing too out of the ordinary for the PS2, the models and facial animation are very lackluster, and for a game that revolves so much about the story and presentation via the cutscenes, it's hard not to notice. The fighting animation is mostly acceptable, but it lacks the impact and weight that made the original game so fondly remembered. The colors, texture, and art design is also unattractive. Metro City, its inhabitants, patrons, and even the returning cast simply look ugly. And while the idea of bringing the cast up to modern times and a few years older is fairly novel, the execution certainly leaves a lot to be desired. The music is a big letdown considering the pedigree of the series, with most tracks being forgettable or licensed from real-life artists that seem kind of ill-fitted for the game overall. Perhaps the biggest issue in the game lies in its tone. Final Fight Streetwise is a mature experience. Profanity-laden, brutally perverted, and in need of a good cleaning for the eyes and ears, the game never really finds solid footing in just what it wants to ultimately be. The open world aspect is interesting, but quite gated, and the dynamic nature of the NPCs will get on the nerves quickly with nonsensical lines and constant interruption as you make your way through the city. The original game was violent, but left a lot up to the imagination, but Streetwise takes an uncomfortable turn into the realm of barbarism, with Kyle seemingly happy to actually snap bones or torture his way to information. A simple knife throw in the original game will simply knock the enemy off his feet, whereas now Streetwise literally makes you shank your opponent with blood pouring out of their bodies. Tonally, the game never really quite seems to know what it wants to be. On one hand, it wants the player to take this story somewhat seriously, but it also makes use of humor far too often with jokes that now seem mean-spirited and downright offensive. The original game series told simple tales of revenge and rescue, which isn't groundbreaking, mind you, but with Metro City now being so run down and just awful, and the characters so shallow and devoid of any likable qualities, Streetwise comes more off as a parody of itself than an homage to the action movies of the 1980s. The game does come with an arcade-like mode that mostly mirrors what Studio 8 was attempting to do with Seven Sons. You pick your character and take to the streets in a 3D brawler that, while clearly rushed, makes a valiant effort to mimic final fights of the past. Sadly, the fighting system and the enemies were not balanced for this style of game, so it's exceedingly hard, featuring only three lives and zero continues. Aside from all of that though, it's important to note where the brawler genre found itself circa 2006. By the time Final Fight Streetwise was on the market, games such as Namco's excellent Urban Rain, as well as Santa Monica Studios' God of War, had released and showcased what a 3D brawler could be. And right around the corner was God Hand, perhaps the finest example of the Final Fight template in 3D. Even with the franchise's pedigree and fan-favorite characters, Final Fight Streetwise just simply couldn't compete with these games, and it's truly a shame because you can clearly see a lot of love and care went into the fundamentals of the fighting, but it's bogged down by decision making that probably came from higher places than Capcom to make the game more marketable to the mainstream Grand Theft Auto crowd. Sadly, the game also underperformed, leading to the closure of Capcom Production Studio 8 mere weeks after its release. Perhaps not as bad as some make it out to be, Final Fight Streetwise is still a massively flawed game with too many issues along the road to truly ever become enjoyable. The game's story ends on a cliffhanger note, but as it's now been nearly two decades since its release, I think it's safe to say that this might be the last we ever see of Kyle, Cody, and The Glow. Thanks, Matt. But before we step away from Streetwise, I also want to touch on the technical differences between the PS2 and Xbox versions, should you still desire to play it. Both versions of the game are limited to just 480i output, which is rather unusual for Xbox. But it still has slightly better image quality since the PS2 version uses field rendering. I also noticed more slowdown in the Xbox version, which is surprising. 
And yeah, the game itself, I agree. It's a flawed title with an interesting and well-implemented battle system that falls short due to its need to expand into a larger world. The minigame's dialogue and Chenmu-like design just don't work for Final Fight, and the atmosphere is all wrong. It's fascinating to play with today, but it's not a great follow-up to the original Final Fight. Today, Final Fight is fondly remembered as a cornerstone of the golden age of arcades, and one of Capcom's finest and most important releases of all time. The simple pick-up-and-play mechanics, the memorable cast of characters, the beginnings of an ever-expanding universe of lore and canon that still continues to this day, Final Fight is simply put one of the finest games of all time, and created the benchmark for a genre that would see incredible popularity through the 1980s and 1990s. In the 90s, the animated Street Fighter series, best known for its cheesy line reading and questionable production quality, would feature a full episode dedicated to Final Fight, starring most of the principal cast. The main cast of characters are very much kept alive and well in Capcom's game Legacy, with the continued saga of Guy and Cody being present in Street Fighter 4 and Poison joining into the fray alongside Hugo and Rolento. Poison would even go on to represent Capcom in the somewhat underrated Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Hagar would make his long-awaited fighting game debut in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, while Lucia Morgan and Abigail made their debut in Street Fighter V. Final Fight may have seen the last chapter written now in its own series of games, but it's clear that fans, as well as Capcom themselves, have great love for these characters. The music of Final Fight, through its many interpretations and sequels, is also among the most widely beloved in all of Capcom's history, and was given the premium treatment when in 2014, the manufacturer City Connection put out a five disc compilation featuring all the music from the entire series on five discs. Sand Streetwise due to its heavy use of licensed music and obscurity in Japan. The set even comes with a DVD featuring footage from the Takada no Baba Gassen Mikado tournament of Final Fight Revenge, as well as an arcade superplay and interviews with the sound staff is truly a must-have for hardcore fans of the series. Capcom even gave their blessing to an official fan film based on the series called Final Fight The Broken Gear, starring wrestler and MMA star Don Fry as Hagar and what is possibly the greatest casting ever in a video game movie. Seriously, the man is Hagar. The cabinet itself, of which many fondly remember seeing at their local arcade, or laundromat can now be authentically replicated at home thanks to One Up Arcade and the release of the Final Fight Mini Arcade Unit. One of the more elaborate ways to play Final Fight that has come up in recent years is the reproduction arcade cabinet from Arcade One Up. When My Life in Gaming was asked if we'd be interested in a review sample, picking Final Fight was a no-brainer, although in retrospect, another choice might have been more useful from a hardware perspective, but I'll explain why later. The original artwork is beautifully reproduced, but of course it loses authenticity points due to its 17-inch LCD screen, and it is of course not a full-size cabinet. Like many other arcade 1UP machines, while Final Fight is the marquee title, it is not alone with this cabinet also offering the original Ghosts and Goblins, fellow CPS-1 stablemate Strider, and the rising developed CPS-2 title 1944, The Loopmaster. You'll notice that Other Ocean Interactive is among the companies listed upon boot up. Other Ocean is actually the development studio behind the Digital Eclipse brand of classic game re-releases. I consider this to be a positive sign, actually, because I've generally approved of the pixel scaling techniques that they've used in recent years. Now, while I don't know to what extent Other Ocean should be credited with Arcade 1UP's emulation, this is unfortunately not their best work in the presentation department. In fact, if I'm being honest, the non-integer, non-interpolated scaling on display here is just about the worst I've ever seen. It's especially noticeable right from the beginning of Final Fight on the buildings in the background. The pixel lines and columns are wildly inconsistent, and they shimmer like crazy as you move from left to right. The picture is also fairly noisy for some reason, and unfortunately there are no video settings at all, not even a scanline filter or anything like that. All that said, I do still enjoy this cabinet. I mean, it's nice to have something that 
resembles an arcade machine in my own home, and it's a fun, no-fuss novelty to entertain guests with and expose them to some of Capcom's arcade classics. But there is potential to turn this into something a bit more robust. I haven't looked too deeply into the particulars yet, but these arcade one-up cabinets have become popular for people to mod and connect a Raspberry Pi or even a Mist or two. It's a bit tricky because the monitors don't use standard video connectors, but there are places online selling mod pieces a la carte or entire kits. But the actual Final Fight cabinet isn't necessarily the best base for building such a machine, since it only features two action buttons per player, while certain other arcade one-up cabinets offer six buttons. But regardless, it's something to keep in mind and could really turn one of these casual amusements into something much more enticing to retro enthusiasts. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that there were three recent options for playing Final Fight in an official capacity today. We've just looked at the one-up cabinet, but what about the other two? Well, there's still the Capcom Home Arcade unit, which was sold here in Europe. It features a selection of Capcom CPS1 and CPS2 games and features excellent controls. The stick itself isn't the most attractive thing, but it's a great way to play these games. Lastly, there's the Capcom Beat'em Up Bundle slash Capcom Belt Action Collection, released for Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and the PC. It's a solid collection of Capcom brawlers all in one place, and yeah, it's pretty good and also worth checking out. But at this point, we've talked about so many different iterations of Final Fight, including so many ports of the original game and its various sequels. For my money, the original Final Fight remains the absolute best in the series, and it's a world-class example of how to do the brawler right. While I do prefer games like Streets of Rage 2 in the end, Final Fight is right up there. This marks the end of our journey in the streets of Metro City for now. We hope you enjoyed this extensive look at the series and have gained a better impression of the impact these games had on the industry as a whole, as well as the many interesting inspirations that went into making one of Capcom's finest works of all time. Hopefully having fought our way through and overcome all the challenges, we can finally save Richard together. Hey dudes, thanks for rescuing me. Let's go for a burger. <laughs>